In this video, we will go through the process for deriving the Einstein field equations in vacuo and then in the presence of matter using the variational approach. So we seek an action for gravitation that leads to the field equations of general relativity in the absence of matter and energy, so that's in vacuum, in vacuo. In the absence of any matter and energy, there only remains space-time and any curvature it might have. So we seek a Lagrangian L that is a scalar function of the metric G subscript alpha beta and its derivatives. Now it turns out the simplest and only such scalar is the Ricci scalar R, which can be obtained from the Riemann tensor through successive contractions. So our Lagrangian then, L, is the Ricci scalar R. And the Einstein-Hilbert action is S, and that's the integral over a volume of the Lagrangian um, over this volume element in four-dimensional space-time. And that can be written as the Ricci scalar times this volume element here. That'll be the integral over that volume element. <coughs> now, the integral is taken over the whole of space-time if it converges. If the integral does not converge, then S is not well defined, but can be made so by integrating over an arbitrarily large but compact region. That is a region where all the parts are connected. There's no disconnected separate parts. So, so long as the region is compact, then it can be integrated over that region and the result will still produce the field equations. So the variation of the action then requires that delta S equals zero. So delta S is the variation of that integral we saw on the previous page, which is the Lagrangian over the volume element. And writing, rewriting here the Ricci scalar in terms of the Ricci tensor times the inverse metric is the product of the Ricci tensor and the inverse metric gives us this times this volume element here, we're integrating over that. Now we bring the variation, the delta inside the integral sign here, and we want the variation of these three objects here, these three components. So this product made up of three objects, three terms multiplied together there. So we seek the variation of the inverse metric times the second two, then the variation of the square root of the determinant of the metric times these two, and then finally the variation of the Ricci tensor itself. So going down to the next line, we have the first term written out again. Um, this in the middle term now here, we've contracted here to to, re to regain the Ricci scalar R, and then finally this term here. <coughs> okay, next line down, we get the variation of this object here, that, so rewriting the first term down here. This second part here, the variation of the metric determinant, the square root of the determinant of the metric, has been covered in a separate video on the um, variation of the metric determinant, um, and that produced this result here. So I'll refer you back to, to that video on this channel. Uh, I won't go through that here now. Then we still have the third term here. There we go. All right, now if we collect some terms here, uh, looking at the metric tensor, uh, is it the Ricci tensor, sorry, here, and the inverse metric here, times the Ricci scalar, which we obtained here. So we factorize out the inverse metric term and the determinant, the square root of the determinant here, gives us this object here, which is already looking familiar as the Einstein field equations, or we can see it starting beginning to emerge. And then we have this uh, final part over here, which is the variation of the Ricci tensor, and we need to deal with that. <coughs> so let's have a look at the Riemann tensor. Here's by definition, here's the Riemann tensor here, made up of these terms. Contracting to the Ricci tensor gives us, if we contract on the first and third indices, as we do here, then this object up here becomes this. Now, varying the Ricci tensor, delta r mu beta here, gives us this object here. 
and the variation um, crosses over is interchangeable commutes with the partial derivative here so we can take it inside and then here the variation of this term here means the product rule applies and we get the variation of the first term times the second and then we get the second term times the variation of the first so varying this term here gives us these two here and then the variation of this final term here gives us these two here by the product rule or Leibniz process. Now the first two terms of this expression suggest the difference between two covariate derivatives looking here and then these terms here and that turns out to be the case and the next uh, couple of slides we'll be looking at that. So okay so let's say we're given this the covariate derivative of this object here the Christoffel symbol or the variation I should say of the Christoffel symbol if we carry out the covariate derivative of that then we get the partial derivative of the variation of the Christoffel symbol the variation of the affine connection and then we get each of these terms here one for each index here so the upper index gives us the positive term here and then these two lower indices gives us give, give us these two negative terms here all right um, now just uh, change some indices around here just permute some indices here um, alpha is replaced with beta um, and beta is replaced with alpha and that gives us this expression here which will help us shortly what we can then write is that the difference of these two is the difference of this expression and with this expression and when we do that we find that two of them disappear out they cancel out and it turns out that this one and this one cancel out so long as there's no torsion in the manifold then this uh, this um, connection here is identical to this connection here the symmetry in the lower indices there being no torsion on the manifold then this affine symbol here and this are equal to each other both of these are the same same indices and so on so these will cancel out when we do subtraction and we'll be left with all these other terms here and that's what this object is so that gives us an expression for the variation of the Ricci tensor All right, so the variation on the Ricci tensor is the difference of these two covariate derivatives as we saw on the previous page. Now, relabeling an index gives the term needed for the action integral that we were using some slides earlier. So, if we get rid of beta here and we put mu in, uh, we get that changes correspondingly here. Beta is replaced with mu, and the same here. Now, this is the expression we can use given our choice of indices and so on from earlier on near the beginning of this set of slides so how do we get this result I've given you a result here with no uh, reason for how I came by by the end product so let's go back and start having a look now to, to justify what's been done all right so we take the covariant derivatives having this form a basis vector times the partial derivative and if we remember that the um, partial derivative of a covariant basis vector is this object and the partial derivative of a contravariant basis vector is this object here. Then we can express the argument of the derivative in its tensor basis form and carry out the appropriate operation. So that's what we're going to do on the next page. Try and justify how I got these objects here from the previous pages. So, okay, so let's have a look at the covariant derivative of this, the variation of the Christoffel symbol or a variation of the affine connection. So writing it out in its basis form. There we go, as we saw earlier, this symbol here is the um, tensor product symbol. We're writing these out. Now to save space, we're going to drop the tensor product symbol. And we're just going to work our way through here, this object here. And so we'll have the partial derivative of that times all this. And then we'll have the partial derivative of this basis vector times this and the other terms and then we'll have the partial derivative of this one times all the rest and then we'll have the partial derivative of the final one here times all the other stuff here all right we'll write that out again just putting the basis vectors now more obviously together except the first one here 
So we're collecting these, putting them in order. Right here. Same thing down here. And what we'll do is we'll just relabel a couple of indices. And coming down here, we'll have E lambda, E rho, E nu, E nu. And so lambda, rho, nu, and nu. And then here we've got an alpha here. Now we can replace that with a rho. Because alpha and alpha, they're dummy indices over which we sum, they can be replaced. And what we can do is you can actually swap them with this row and this row here. Because we want an E row in their final product of basis vectors. So they can be swapped. Uh, we've got E row here, E row. When we do that, we get this object here, this one here. We can see that they're all the same now. So we can factorize them out in the last line. There we go. And we're left with this expression in brackets here, which is the covariant derivative, if you like, of the variation of this affine connection. Or the variation of the um, Christoffel symbol here. Next step. So the component form is this. Now what we'd just like to do is to um, use the indices that we've started out, that we've given the, our original problem is, uh, in on the previous earlier pages or slides. So relabeling, I'll get rid of lambda and put alpha in there um, and a few others. So I'm just relabeling indices as all that's happening here. And the same here as well. Now we'll just permute the indices a bit and we'll put beta here and here we go. We'll carry on like that. Okay. And we now know where these expressions come from, how they're derived. Next step now, let's go back to the integral, that final term in our uh, integral of the Lagrangian there, our action. Just have a look at this final term here. So we've got the inverse metric times the variation in the Ricci tensor, uh, integrated over four-dimensional volume in space-time. And what we're going to do now is replace this variation in the Ricci tensor with what we've derived in the last couple of slides. Okay, now, metric compatibility means we can take the inverse metric here inside the covariant derivative. And so we can go here, same over here, take it inside. So expand out this line here to give us this, this one here. Next, down the bottom here, we've got... Uh, same thing again, just lab relabeling some indices. Uh, swap the alpha and the nu here, nu and nu. Can be swapped with alpha and alpha. They're dummy indices, they sum out. And this layer leads to this line here. Next stage, if we notice that um, nu and nu, nu and nu sum out, and we're left with just the alpha here and an alpha here. Now, here, we get uh, same thing again, mu go out, mu and mu uh, sum out, and we're left with just alpha again. So we're left with an object, whatever this object is, it's a single index object. Uh, so why don't we call all of this A with the index alpha? So it's like a vector. So really it is, it's, it's, a, it's a rank one tensor here. The difference of these here is a rank one tensor, just like a vector. So what we end up with is a covariant derivative of this vector integrate out of this volume. Now this looks like the divergence theorem is needed here to evaluate this integral. So just reminding you of divergence theorem, um, just over some, you've got some vector here, here's a normal to some surface, you've got some vector field across this surface here. Now in vector form, the theorem is expressed as an integral over a volume of del or nabla dot a over some volume, and that's the integral of a dotted with some normal to a surface. And so we're integrating the vector A over some surface here. So this is one dimension less than this one. And what that means is, in generalized coordinates, the divergence theorem can be written in this format here. Um, the covariant derivative of this vector integrated over some four-dimensional volume, space-time in our case. And over a surface, if we reduce, reduce from one dimension from four down to three, we induce a metric on the surface. So instead of going from a metric in four dimensions, we now have a metric in three dimensions. And that's what this square root negative h is. That's the 
square root of the determinant of this induced metric is our normal vector n subscript alpha and what we will find is that the last surface integral is taken over the boundary of space-time where we have set of course the variation to be zero then when you do variation problems at the boundaries the variation is set to be zero so that this integral over a four-dimensional space-time region becomes this over the surface the boundary surface of space-time here that's zero and that implies that that last term from the earlier slide, much earlier in the video, is zero. And this leads to the following variation in the action. We just left with delta s is equal to this object here. So there's where we sit. Now, setting delta s is zero, and given that the variation in the inverse metric is totally arbitrary, we get the Einstein field equations in vacuum because we're left with just this object has got to be set to zero in order to satisfy this condition that delta s is zero. The argument of the integrand must be zero. Now these equations describe a space-time region that is empty of matter and energy. They're in vacuo or vacuum. Note also that we can write the above variation in terms of its functional derivative as being delta s is this object here, which is what we just found. But it can be set here. Here, the variation in the Lagrangian with respect to the inverse metric times the inverse metric integrated over the four-dimensional region. And that implies that delta s divided by this, delta inverse metric, divided through by this object here, leaves us with the integral of this object over d4, four dimensions. And so that tells us that the variation of this with respect to the inverse metric gives us the Einstein field equations in vacuum. Here it is. Now let's consider a space-time that is not empty but contains matter. All we need to do is to add a second action term, S subscript M, representing the matter to the Einstein-Hilbert action, S subscript EH. So our new action will be S, is this object here, the Einstein-Hilbert action, this time with constants, plus some matter action, whatever that is. That's what we want to find. So varying this action gives delta S with respect uh, delta s over delta inverse metric times in this factor one on the square root of the, the metric of the determinant the de de sorry one on the square root of the determinant of the metric is this object here our, our constants which make the Einstein equations work out I won't go into that here times this object here which we've already found uh, plus have a look at this bit here now all this has got to be set to zero well, we know what this is. That's just the Einstein equation in vacuo. Here's our constants. So this object here must be equal to the negative of this because it's all equal to zero. So rearranging that gives us the left arm, the Einstein tensor on the left here is this object here. Now the expression on the right contains the energy momentum tensor T subscript menu, a rank two tensor and is defined as this object here. Now, substitution of this term leads to the familiar Einstein equation. So if I replace this object here, which is T subscript mu, I'll get this object down here. Now this gives us the Einstein field equations, which relate the curvature of space-time on the left-hand side to the matter energy content of space-time on the right-hand side. So this is the curvature of space-time on the left-hand side here, and this is the matter and energy content in that space-time over here, and that relates the two.